Thank you. Welcome to this uh, interview on behalf of Plato's Caves. We are very happy to uh, welcome you. And uh, let me begin by uh, saying that it has been an absolute thrill reading uh, your latest book, uh, The Field Notes from a Waterborne Land. Mm -hmm. A wonderful title, a very intriguing title, and such a sweep from uh, Purulia to Sundarban to the remote forests of uh, Orissa and the narration of so many intricately woven stories about such varied characters. It's a wonderfully uh, moving uh, book. Uh, let me begin. Uh, <laughs> the pleasure is ours, uh, obviously. <laughs> let me begin by asking you, what actually set you off on this journey? Apart from that unfinished project that you talk about, what exactly connects uh, the desire to find these narratives and weave them together? Actually, uh, you know, it has been, uh, uh, the book has been germinating inside me for quite some time. And uh, I think more than 15 or I think two decades, actually. Uh, I love to travel. I used to travel a lot in, in different parts of the country as well as in our state also. And um, I was actually, uh, when I began this project of, uh, of looking at the missing children who were you know, dropping out of schools. I found out that uh, it, this is not an isolated stories. Uh, these, 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 these are connected with uh, different narratives of people's life and livelihood and all those things. And uh, uh, I slowly I drifted towards the 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 other. Uh, stories, uh, the patterns uh, that were connected. And uh, this project gave me a sort of an alibi to, you know, go to these uh, places to meet people and all. And uh, my, as, as I, as I uh, uh, do this, uh, into this project more and more, I uh, my focus shifted. I began to look at other aspects of life, for example. And I have told someone that primary education is like a prism, you know, where all the uh, it 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 refracts the light as as a prism refracts light, and uh, you know, similarly, all the issues that are otherwise muddled and connected in our society. Uh, these are a sort of can be seen. For example, in, uh, in uh, we we have grown up uh, hearing the myth that in West Bengal caste system is not so prevalent as in other parts of northern India. But I found that that's not true. If you look at the enrollment um, data and the dropouts, you know, is hugely uh, the caste uh, um, bias is is hugely there. And, uh, and and the ecological aspects also. Large parts of South Bengal uh, suffer from floods, periodic flooding from, you know, almost every year, which go unreported in the media. Uh, and we don't get to know about this, particularly because these floodings happen um, during late September, early October, when we have Durga Puja. And all, we go into a celebration mode forgetting that thousands of people in different districts, particularly in southern districts, are affected by flood and that create dropouts. And for, for a long time, you know, the trafficking of, of girls, trafficking of children, all, all these data have been there, but somehow we have not tried to connect them. And so there is this, uh, this I, I I I found that there is a story, a connected story of of, of deprivation of um, 
you know, of uh, people missing out on opportunities, as well as stories of people's struggles, people's, uh, you, know, the, you, know, you know, heroic battles, people fight to serve, just to survive. Mm. So all these things, uh, you know, drew me in and somehow that this, this book happened, you know. Uh, initially, I began to write in bits and pieces in various media. I used to write for a daily newspaper for some time. I used to write a fortnightly column in an English daily, Telegraph. And um, slowly, this, 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 this joined and became sort of this book. One term that kept flashing in my mind because of my own academic orientation while reading the book is the term subaltern. Because uh, mm -hmm. in our own academic parlance, this is the kind of term that we would regularly use in order to describe such lives. Obviously, you have avoided using any kind of academic jargon while writing this uh, book. And uh, yet, uh, the fact of the matter is that if one is to look at it from that kind of a perspective, this is a wonderful documentation of such subaltern lives and their history. Something that sort of began uh, with the subaltern studies collective, but has uh, very uh, mysteriously petered out, whether within the academia or outside as well. Uh, as somebody who is also a part of the academia, how do you uh, perceive this absence, this erasure? of uh, subaltern lives and uh, their histories from our uh, consciousness, from our intellectual activity? Well, I'm not very really sure if, uh, if, if the focus on the subaltern lives and subaltern studies have, have as you are saying, have shifted. Maybe it has changed names because you must have noticed that during the last uh, around a decade in Bengal, we have a lot of focus nowadays on Dalit literature, uh, which was not there earlier. So right. subaltern studies also uh, started in a very you know academic setup and it never percolated to to the general culture, cultural studies or 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 media or other aspects. So it was restricted mostly to the academia, but now we see that uh, there is this focus on the lit literature, on marginal literature, seminars are being organized. I am not very, uh, uh, you know, I am I'm, I'm not always very tuned to these academic activities, <laughs> although I, I belong to somehow uh, to to teaching and all, but I I know that uh, this, this there, there is that that thing is there. But uh, one thing you what you mentioned I must uh, uh, say that yes during the last around two decades uh, from our so called bhadralok culture I did not use the term subaltern but I have from the yes. title subtitle itself I have been using the term bhadralok. Yes. Uh, from the Bhadralok, uh, uh, in the Bhadralok universe, I might say, our cultural universe, it has become so narrowed in the last two decades to certain stereotypes which are exclusively, you know, the middle class, educated, urban, Hindu, upper caste, uh, cultural codes and we have been telling these stories uh, to others and we have been telling these stories to ourselves so much uh, that in that sense yes this this uh, the marginal the subaltern the larger the majority the large majority of of bengal's people their life their livelihoods are being sort of uh, are missing from our narratives that is true one of the very interesting episodes within the book was when uh, these uh, villagers, without any knowledge of uh, Bengali or awareness of Bengali high culture, are being given a glimpse of Pathir Panchali in that uh, remote uh, school uh, setup. 
and uh, the yes, yes. yes and their reactions their responses particularly uh, the way you connect the journey of the train to their uh, mm. understanding of the train that takes their parents away from their families to uh, various seasonal agricultural laboring work and again this is something which has been going on for uh, decades right the kind of uh, uprooting of uh, seasonal uprooting of lives and attendant dislocations and uh, discriminations all of this has been part of the lives of these people for uh, decades now and yet this is not something that uh, inspires artistic representation in the way that different uh, episodes of history associated with bhadralok nostalgia or bhadralok memory does i mean whether it is the partition whether it is the gentrification of northern kolkata and those dilapidated buildings or whatever else you can think of that kind of consciousness is something which we repeatedly witness being exhibited in the artistic world but uh, the other side of that the flip side of that uh, has not been explored even by even though you know we have had so many seminal artists from bengal yet uh, very few people have actually dared to explore true uh, yes uh, that episode that that uh, event uh, uh, you are referring to was actually took place in shimli pal which is in odisha but yes uh, in 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 different parts of west bengal uh, huge uh, segments of the population go on seasonal work whether it's farm work or it, it, nowadays it's building construction and stay away from home and uh, i just uh, uh, i i described that situation where how the children are responding to that famous scene in pothar panchali and uh, we actually take for granted certain things we never think that certain symbols certain motifs which are so intrinsic part of our bhadralok upbringing and which are so much part of our identity uh, doesn't always uh, fit into the lives of of these people of the of the large majority of the people hmm. uh, for example as i was telling you about durga puja just for the last around uh, two decades there have been a huge you know uh, sort of commercialized and mostly focused on kolkata the, yeah. as you said the gentrification of kolkata mostly focused on kolkata but uh, it is as i told just as i was referring to you that for a large majority of bengal's population that time of the year it's they are not in the celebration mood they have other uh, our, we have they have some other festivals as well. for example some some other pujas like shitola puja monsa puja they have and very localized and regional the baruni um, mela that you uh, described there is baruni mela yes that i have referred to uh, of a particular mutua community for them it's it's a huge thing so these things uh, we we uh, we have set certain stereotypes of our culture and we try to fit them fit into it uh, everything but this this cannot be fit actually this opu story is uh, is is like that we we tell ourselves that opu story is the story of the quintessential bengali story the aspiration the opu is the renaissance man is an aspiring big education enlightened sin Uh, a boy uh, leaving his village coming to the city uh, but this is the story of the bhadra log actually opu 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 is a brahmin opu although his father was poor but they have the social uh, network to to help them when it's needed opu story is not the story of all the bengalis so i have repeatedly in the book i have placed opu story as a motif and try to see how it sort of connects with the the other sto- the stories of other people so yes another uh, influence which kept uh, haunting me during the reading of the book was the presence of amitav ghosh i mean i'm sure you must have noticed while uh, preparing the manuscript that 
echoes of Ghosh and echoes of themes and ideas associated with Ghosh's novels kept percolating mm-hmm. into the stories in uh, different ways. Uh, uh, is that was that conscious or unconscious? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, particularly in the last uh, segment of the book, the last sections of the book where the the narrative shifts to Sundarbans and the mangroves and the mm-hmm. islands that we are losing. Uh, you cannot. Uh, the Amitabh Ghosh has has done such tremendously important work, but uh, in his hungry times and as well as in his other writings, also in his recent Ghana Island, you cannot uh, get away from that. So, of course, uh, I was consciously was ever. In fact, one of the characters in the it's book who, from yes. the beginning to end, his name is Amitabha. But of course, that is not really a conscious choice. But later on, someone pointed out to me that his name is Amitabha, but his spelling is different, of course. Yes. He's not Amitabh. Yes, uh, yes uh, Amitabh has been a huge influence. But I would like to mention another uh, writer, uh, researcher, who actually who also influenced Amita Ghos and uh, Amita Ghos has acknowledged her contribution is Onu Jale. Onu Jale is hmm. is of being a French uh, Bengali. I think her one of her parents uh, was French, but she is she is also she also lived uh, in Bengal. She she knows Bengali language and she she lived for for many years in the Sundarbans and worked there. And in Hungry Tides, I guess Amit Abhus has uh, acknowledged his uh, his debt to Onujala. I have read Onujala. Onujala has a beautiful book on 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 Sundarbans. But uh, other than Amit Abhus, uh, Onujala and these kind of works, uh, those uh, particularly the Sundarbans and the mangroves and the the threat these 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 areas are facing. Uh, these have not been uh, explored much uh, in the right, apart from some academic uh, work. But uh, we need more such work, you know, on these areas because this is a huge global story on the sinking yeah. islands of, of of all the aspects of this disaster that is unfolding in, in the Sundarbans. And that also connects India and Bangladesh because the yes. same same thing. The parts of uh, you know Sundarbans is half more than half of the Sundarbans is in Bangladesh, and there there also this is some story. Ecology, migration, poverty, and uh, the struggles of these uprooted individuals to somehow remake their lives. This is something, uh, again, so that sort of connects uh, the different uh, sites across which the book is uh, spread. Whether it is those uh, villagers whose uh, villages have been eroded due to the shiftings of the river, whether it is the sinking islands of Sundarbon, whether it is the uh, tribal communities who have been migrating and journeying across the subcontinent for generations either displaced by mines or by pumping stations or dams and so on. This is something that sort of connects the different sites uh, across which the book travels. And again, uh, this is something which uh, is also counterbalanced by that Bhitir Tan that you also uh, exactly. speak of. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and th- again, uh, this... Uh, uh, this uh, juxtaposition of Bhitir Tan and the constant movement, this seems to form a kind of a rhythm that punctuates the lives of these uh, people. And uh, in contrast to that, many of us keep on celebrating a very different kind of a journey, either a a transnational journey that will take us from India to various affluent uh, spaces in uh, the West or in other more... uh, prosperous parts of India. That is the kind of journey that the Bhadralok uh, keeps uh, mapping. And that is, what I, and again, I keep coming back to that. I mean, you look at films like The Bong Connection and uh, the kind of hype and myths surrounding uh, these uh, films. And then you have the lives of these people 
which remain outside uh, films, outside stories, outside even uh, popular cultural uh, representations in varied ways. I don't know if you've seen this one uh, interesting uh, departure from this would be the Behala Art Fest. I don't know if you've been there. But last year in the Behala Art Fest, they were, they, there were all these drawings and they were talking about, uh, you know, uh, the migrant workers, particularly in the post uh, lockdown era, how they had to, you know, leave uh, their belongings and shift and travel across uh, the land in very uh, horrible circumstances. And uh, one of the pictures had this uh, very uh, interesting collage, a La La Land on the one hand and uh, the migrants packing all their belongings and traveling on the road. And it's almost like the Bhadrulok itself is living in a kind of, the Bengali Bhadrulok is itself living in a kind of a La La Land. Yes. And, uh, the few uh, you know, uh, examples of Bhadralok figures that we do encounter in the book, uh, uh, obviously they don't come across very well. And I remember the mild acidic taste that you referred to in relation to your experience in Nabodiganto and such other uh, uh, sites where the Bhadraloks try to impose their culture on the subalterns, quote unquote subalterns, and uh, refashion their uh, lives. Uh, one of the things that I kept uh, reminding myself while reading this book and other associated texts is something that Spivak said about unlearning our privileges in order to learn from uh, the subaltern. And uh, the interactions that you had with all of these characters, it does seem that at least on certain occasions, you were able to unlearn your privileges in order to learn about their stories. What, what, what does it take to actually do that? Well, uh, it is a very difficult thing to unlearn really. I don't know whether I have succeeded that, in that. Uh, yesterday, someone was asking me about um, another. I, I, I gave an interview for 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 a newspaper, and they asked me that. Tell us uh, what uh, advantages did you have as a Bhojolo as you uh, as you were writing the book, and what challenges you faced. So I said that advantage. Uh, yes, I mean uh, when I when I decided that I'll be working on this. I discovered the kind of social network we Bhajaloks have. Uh, you know, we are not always aware of it um, until we, we need that when we are in an emergency situation or in a crisis or whatever. I found that from the bureaucracy, from the school education department to NGOs to district level um, administration, I, I could connect with someone who is either a friend's friend or a relative's friend or whatever. Uh, which which is the advantage, of course, which helped me to connect because otherwise you cannot just airdrop to a place. You know, it is not possible. I have to the places I have visited, the remote outbacks. It's not possible for me to just go there and interview people. It's it cannot be done. So I needed that network, but I was also all the time I was aware that the kind of power and the position of power and privilege from which I was reaching out to them. I was going to them. I was receiving their hospitality and even their confidence. They were telling, telling stories to me. I kept thinking that uh, let's just imagine a, a young man from a tribal village in Purulia decides to uh, work on how Hadraloks in Kolkata live and comes to interview us, would we, uh, would we, would we offer him tea? Would we uh, invite him in our home? Would we give him uh, two hours of our time? So there is this, uh, you know, from, um, uh, it is very difficult to un uh, unlearn, but I had a glimpse that, yes, there, there are these other stories. I, we need to calibrate our, sense of perspective sometimes to understand those stories not only the 
things that they said, but sometimes the, the, those unsaid parts, something they did not say, the silences, that sometimes uh, said more about, and much of it was very painful also. You know, for example, the story of that Nodia girl, if you remember, who whose parents were actually making a compromise between their radical, quote-unquote quote -unquote radical aspiration and their yeah. economic situation. They were sending the boy to an English, an English medium school medium and the girl school. to a, a Sarkari Bengali medium school. And the girl wanted to be a teacher. Uh, so that... Uh, a very simple uh, question I asked her, what do you want to be? Because these are the common questions that people ask. And she said, I want to be a teacher. And uh, it was, it, it, uh, suddenly I became aware of, uh, yes, the girl can be a teacher, but in the school where uh, her brother studies, where her parents could not afford to send her, she will be a teacher there and underpaid, exploited, uh, you know, teacher in a small private English, not English medium actually, the English medium only by name, Fine. a school where mostly dropouts, college dropouts go to teach for, you know, very small sum of salary, which is not salary actually, sometimes they're, they're unpaid also. So this kind of, uh, this reality, this kind of story is there. But to come to the earlier point that you made about Bhitetan and um, and the push, the pull and the push, that is very important. One thing we tend to forget that, uh, uh, you know, uh, is that uh, there was a huge migration uh, during, before and during partition from 1945, 46 to 47, 48, and large, and mostly the people like us, the Bodrologs migrated during that time. And uh, they have the nostalgia for a lost homeland, that thing is very strong. And this, after all these, uh, uh, so many years, this is, this has not, uh, uh, this has not tapered off, but this is very much strongly there in our culture. But we tend to miss out the fact that uh, during the 60s and particularly during the 70s, there had been massive migrations also, particularly the, the marginal, the lower strata of the society, the so-called Nohosudros and others who, who were forced to leave. Just think, they, uh, they did not leave when, the, when things started hotting up. They were staying there. They were, uh, you know, uh, trying to forge a life and livelihood for so long. So their bitter turn is uh, not less, but much stronger than, um, which I have also written about such characters, than, than the people like us who whose parents or whose forefathers migrated during that time. But that... Uh, history, that part of the history is not uh, we don't focus on that part of the history as much as we focus on the on the migrations, on the nostalgia, homeland nostalgia of, of the middle class Vodrulok. Recently in, in writings uh, of the writers like Monoranjan Bapari and others these, these things are coming which is a very good sign because that is a very important uh, component of our shared history. So, yes, I mean, that is important. But what you said about unlearn, what Gachi Chakravarti Spivak has said about unlearning, it's very difficult. I mean, we can, uh, I don't know whether uh, it's that easy just to unlearn something, because these are so ingrained. We don't have any other uh, perspective to see the world, we only have because I, I I I cannot even if I try to I cannot erase my identity. And when I go to a to a tribal village, to a forest village, to to the Sundar ones, I cannot erase the fact that I will return uh, to my uh, space, which is a space of privilege, and that uh, that changes the whole thing. I mean. 
So I don't know whether I have been able to come to to communicate to you what I mean. It's a very complex and difficult situation actually. Of course, the book, as you said, is a product of uh, experiences and meditations on these related subjects for at least two decades. What are the principal changes that you witnessed during these decades in the lives of these uh, underprivileged individuals? I, I missed the last part. I mean, what I'm asking is across these two decades, what are the changes that you witnessed in the experiences of these underprivileged people? What sort of new challenges did they have to uh, combat? And uh, how exactly uh, did they devise new strategies of coming out of these predicaments? Well, it's a, it's a very big and complex uh, thing. I mean, uh, just to give you some, some brief uh, glimpse of my experiences is that, first of all, during the last two decades, as I uh, told you earlier, that somehow the focus has shifted. The, if you look at the media, all the discourses, the social media, uh, if just, you know, uh, the Bengali Bhadralok, we the Bengali Bhadralok have been more driven into echo chambers of 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 our own making, where these uh, the the lives, the stories are we are missing them. Uh, so naturally, the 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 life their life have become difficult in many ways. Uh, but uh, if you look at the southern parts of bengal for example the coastal areas the ecology has been uh, you know the ecological crisis has deepened during the last two decades so particularly in the sundarbans the life has become much more difficult the out migration has grown mm -hmm. uh, in in some parts uh, some targeted uh, schemes by the government for example we and we we are part of it we know from close quarters that some of the schemes uh, that are targeted to girl students for example these have helped definitely check and roll i mean dropout rates have it has helped I'm, i don't know how because in the last couple of years we don't have much hard data of how these are affecting this is a very important area which should be worked out but definitely uh, these have helped but uh, the job situation is not so good uh, everywhere in the country as well as in, in west bengal the returns from farming has dwindled the lands have been fragmented and the mm, uh, the positive effects of land reforms that took place uh, during the early 80, early or mid 80s up to the 80s the land reforms in west bengal was extensive and it definitely had some positive effects but you know the uh, it takes time i mean uh, it doesn't it cannot go on for long so small fragmented land the returns from farming dwindling the cost of agriculture growing so uh, the out migration of work of laborers have have increased exponentially. Mm. So life has become tougher, definitely. More in precarious. Some More precarious, uh, but uh, in some other ways, uh, in the in the rural areas, the purchasing power of 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 some segments of the population have grown. Definitely, markets have grown. So. It's a mixed picture. We cannot just say something in black and white. It's a mixed and complex picture, and it varies from region to region. Particularly, as I told you, the Sundarbans, the situation is really grim. Uh, particularly uh, during the last two years, after nearly four major cyclones hitting large parts of the coastal areas of Medinipur, 
in orthodox so jewish bargunas and others so th this uh, is a largely it's a story is very is rather grim it's not it's not a something that 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 we find that something positive happening very soon i think uh, one of the takeaways from the book is this sense of discomfort is this uh, sense of uh, a haunting realization of the precarity of uh, these lives and how we have often remained utterly unconscious about uh, these predicaments and i think uh, for me personally that is uh, the biggest takeaway something to uh, at least uh, temporarily get out of the echo chamber and uh, thank you for uh, giving us such a wonderful window into this uh, complex reality that often eludes us uh, the no the concluding sections of the book keep coming back to this one particular expression a fantastic novel is a fantastic novel also in the offing from you is that something that is germinating within you as well well uh, uh when i uh, most of my writings as you know in in bangla as well as those bangla writings that i have translated into english uh somewhat genre defying i have you know i play with different forms and all and i don't i don't begin with any preconceived notion that now i'll write a memoir or now i i'll write a travel log or something like that but uh yes uh, i don't know the book now i am working on i don't know how or when or whether it will uh, it will when it will take shape or what kind of shape it will take but definitely yes fantasy plays a very important role here because during the last two years our life have become so grim so dark the uncertainty of it all that uh, i found that fantasy is very important to survive we need fantasy positive fantasy to 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 survive to look at the future so let's see what what i can come up with thank you thank you porimalda we will definitely thank you abin to that it has been it has been uh, lovely talking to you thank you thank you and many congratulations on this book as well as uh, what comes next thank, thank, you. You. thank you have a good evening thank you